when it comes to building a cannabis economy in South Africa, what are some of the challenges we're going to have to overcome to be able to successfully build the industry and create jobs in the different verticals, all the way from prescription medical cannabis to responsible adult use and industrial hemp? Well, these are some of the questions that was posed by a recent panel by the African Cannabis Advisory Group to five panelists from completely different backgrounds. And it was an amazing discussion. It really came to the heart of challenges that we've been experiencing as an industry with government in terms of legislation, with implementation and rollouts and planning. And I really hope that you enjoy this panel as much as I enjoyed moderating it because we really got into the meat of what's the problem systemic in the South African cannabis industry. My name is Busiso Klaba, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Africa Cannabis Advisory Group, or ACA Group. We're a services provider that specialized in the medical cannabis and industrial hemp uh, industries. Um, we work with quite a broad range of industry stakeholders, including corporates, governments, entrepreneurs, investors, and we specialize in the conceptualization and execution of uh, cannabis uh, projects. Um, we've got a strong focus on strategy development, investor readiness, capital raising, um, compliance, and global sales and uh, distribution. Today, I'd like to welcome our guests, um, our panelists, and everyone joining us from South Africa and around the world uh, for what promises to be quite an action-packed webinar as we look to unpack the future of South Africa's uh, cannabis industry. Now, before going into tonight's webinar, I'd like to just uh, give a special thanks to our sponsors and partners for making tonight uh, possible. Our platinum spon uh, sponsor tonight uh, is uh, Aeroside Africa, which is a market leading air purification technology provider that has proven to be effective in helping combat um, fungal diseases in cannabis, in, in particular powdery mildew which for anyone who has grown cannabis, especially at scale, uh, can attest to the pervasive and destructive uh, uh, elements of powdery mildew to a cannabis crop. Aeroside was developed in the US uh, for NASA um, in terms of applications within their infrastructure um, and is also effective in ensuring that uh, clean air uh, is uh, present in processing rooms for cannabis operators. We'd also like to highlight and thank our charity partner for tonight's webinar, um, which is Friends of Hemp South Africa, which was founded by a good friend and actually one of our panelists uh, today, Ayanda Bum. Friends of Hemp is a broad-based alliance of South African citizens across the private sector, research institutions, government, NGOs, and associations, and is concerned about the prevention and criminalization of industrial hemp in South Africa. The organization has been set up as an NGO um, and is driven by a desire to unlock the economic and socioeconomic potential of industrial hemp um, in South Africa. The organization looks to ensure that uh, ordinary South Africans have got a, um, a real opportunity to participate uh, in this uh, um, exciting sector. The NGO is playing a very critical role in bringing to, re to reality a thriving and inclusive cannabis economy in South Africa. We encourage a donation of as little as 100 Rand or more to the charity, um, and, we'll, and we will be posting details on how you can do that and learn more about their great work um, in the chat. So let's get straight into it. Um, tonight, we will be unpacking President Zero Ramaphosa's cannabis sector comments from the State of the Nation address in February 2022. Zero Ramaphosa laid out his ambitious vision of utilizing cannabis for significant economic development and job creation, facilitated by positioning South Africa to be a global leader in the cannabis industry. Now, the president's comments have been met with both hope and skepticism. Tonight, we bring together some of South Africa's leading cannabis entrepreneurs and stakeholders to outline how, if at all possible, South Africa can achieve this feat in the face of stiff global competition and limited fiscal resources. It's difficult to believe how cannabis has transitioned from a controversial underworld industry um, that governments around the globe have spent billions of dollars to try and eliminate to today being a global concern transforming the health and wellness of millions of individuals across the globe. Not only that, but the industrial 
potential of cannabis to combat climate change and to create sustainable materials for use across a broad range of industries, including textiles, plastics, building materials, biocomposites, paper, is only just getting started. To really get a glimpse of the potential of the cannabis industry to spur economic growth, create jobs, and improve our health and wellness, two of the world's most advanced economies need to come into focus in terms of cannabis, which is the US and Canada. Now, in the US, despite the fact that cannabis is still federally illegal, the cannabis industry in the US has created north of 400,000 jobs um, to date um, in just a number of in just a short period of, of years, a couple of, um, couple of years. Studies have shown that the use of dangerous and addictive opiates in, this, in, this, in states where cannabis is legalized in the US is on a downward trend as more patients suffering from chronic pain move towards cannabis. Now, remember that opio the opiate crisis in the US is responsible for the death of between 30 and 70,000 people every single year. To date, not a single recorded death has been, um, uh, has been recorded from cannabis uh, overuse. Canada is also another shining example in terms of the potential of this industry. The cannabis economy in Canada has created over 150,000 jobs and over $20 billion in economic value over the last few years in a fully legal framework. It's no wonder that South Africa is betting on cannabis to resuscitate its struggling economy. With an unemployment rate of 35% and growing, South Africa needs to urgently create the right environment for the cannabis economy to thrive, whilst ensuring that the poorest in our country have the opportunity to meaningfully participate in this new legal industry. So my view is 130,000 jobs um, over, let's say, a span of 10 to 15 years is not impossible, but it is a, a, a real challenge. Uh, in, in order for us to bring this into reality. It would require a collaborative effort um, across different key stakeholders, including government, investors, the private sectors, and communities to, to bring this to, to light. The development of a thriving local cannabis economy will also have to be delicately that will also have to delicately balance global best practice, in other words, all the lessons that we learn uh, internationally from advanced economies, uh, with a granular understanding and appreciation of South Africa's unique socio-economic environment. It would, South Africa would also need to develop unique operating and regulatory models that can allow for the integration of traditional growing communities into the legal uh, cannabis framework. South Africa is estimated to have over 900,000 traditional cannabis growers, so this is an extremely important consideration for the country's cannabis future. Research and development would also have to be central to the country's efforts to build this new economy. Not only is work required to map and identify land race strains unique to South Africa, um, IP that we can develop and export to the rest of the world, but well-designed clinical trials would also need to be launched in order to, for us to better understand how to utilize cannabis to improve the health and wellness of our citizens. Further research will also be required to unlock the potential of industrial hemp. As a fairly new legal uh, sort of material, work needs to be done to develop a local hemp supply chain and drive the cost of production down to enable hemp to be an economically viable substitute for traditional, more, more um, carbon intensive uh, materials. Um, the job creation potential in hemp is significant as labor is required on large scale farms, often hundreds if not thousands of hectares uh, big, and more skilled labor will also be required to process and manufacture hundreds of new product lines across hemp. The adult use of the recreational uh, applications uh, and vertical within industry also cannot be forgotten as this is the basis um, from which today's current activities in the, in the cannabis industry actually happen. Uh, and a lot of work would need to be done to create the appropriate frameworks there. I'm excited to unpack this topic further um, with um, the great uh, pan uh, esteemed panelists, as well as my friend and colleague, Jeb Verlinden, who will be leading and moderating today's discussion. Just some quick background on Jeff. Uh, so Jeff is a sales executive at Separations, a company that has been in the South African lab laboratory and pharmaceutical equipment supply and support space for the last three decades. 
Jeff is a biochemist and joined separations in 2010, working in their pharmaceutical support division and has worked with most of South Africa's pharmaceutical companies. Jeff has a passion for cannabis extraction and formulation workflows, along with all the necessary testing analytics to ensure the highest quality products reach consumers. Jeff, over to you uh, to introduce the panel discussion. I'm really excited for, for today's session. Hi, Sibs. Thanks for having us all on to discuss it. Can I ask all the panelists to uh, open up their visuals so we can see them all for the audience? So I'm excited because what we have today is a good mix. We've got uh, licensed cultivators, uh, you know, we've got someone who's really specialized in international trade, so can really speak to the progress of medical cannabis. We've got lobbyists uh, really actively involved in pushing uh, reform within government. Um, we've got someone who's also active across the continent in terms of lobbying reform. And we've got a lawyer. So uh, at the end of the day, if you're going to be in the cannabis space, you need a lawyer there. And we've got subs to give us some advice on financial fundraising and investment banking. So what I'd like to do to get us kicked off um, is... I'd like to have the panelists self-introduce, so to give us a quick synopsis on their role and their function within the cannabis uh, space and community. Um, and I'd like to order it in the following. I'd like Leslie to start us off. Then I'd like to go to Titi. I'd like to go to Yanda, uh, Dunmarie, and then uh, let's get started in terms of a quick introduction. And then we're gonna jump straight into questions. Thanks, Sibs, and uh, thanks, Jeff, for, for having, having me on the panel. I'm really honored. Um, just a bit of background about us. Um, I'm the CEO of Bellbridge. We're a licensed cultivation facility based in the Stellenbosch area of, of the Cape. Um, we come from a strong agricultural background. We're four, fourth generation farmers. We've been farming for over 100 years, supplying um, predominantly the local market with fruit. Um, we got into cannabis uh, in 2019. We were given the go ahead by SAPRA. And uh, we're licensed for 14,000 square meters of cultivation area, um, which is predominantly in greenhouse or all in high-tech greenhouses. And um, to date, we have shipped uh, over a ton of, of flour to Switzerland and um, about 20 shipments of cannabis tissue culture to um, various countries in Europe, um, Spain, Switzerland, uh, North Macedonia, Israel, Canada, Lesotho. Um, yeah, and we've got some exciting things coming up hopefully soon. Awesome, excellent. Uh, let's hand over to Tidi for a quick introduction. Thank you, Jeff. Um, my name is Tidi Khiba, and I'm a practicing lawyer based in Lesotho. I am the founder of Wani Solutions, a cannabis consulting company, as well as a member on the African Union's Expert Committee on Cannabis. Uh, which basically seeks to assist member states in developing their cannabis legislation and reform. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent. Let's go to Yanda. Um, hi, good evening. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Ayanda Bum. Uh, I'm a cannabis entrepreneur. I've been working in the cannabis industry for almost 10 years uh, across four different continents both as uh, an operator, but also as uh, a, a lobbyist and an advisor to government and private sector, uh, particularly around reforms. I'm one of the founders of Friends of Hemp South Africa, which SIPS provided a little bit of an introduction around, uh, but we're one of the national um, associations representing hemp. Um, I serve as the private sector representative on the National Cannabis Master Plan Committee uh, and work with a number of these fine panelists um, on here as well. Uh, but mostly the, the, the work that we advocate for is really around the liberalization of industrial hemp. I also serve on the board of the Federation of Industrial Hemp Organizations, which is the largest uh, hemp federation on the planet, representing uh, 70 countries uh, across all continents. Thank you. Awesome. Danry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dunree Dugat. I'm an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa, and I'm the cannabis lead for Schindler Side Attorneys. We're the first law firm in South Africa with a medical and recreational cannabis department. I practice in general and commercial litigation, commercial drafting, dispute resolution, intellectual property, blockchain, and cannabis law. Thank you so much. Awesome. Excellent. So naturally, I'm inclined to want to go straight for the jugular and ask the question about 130,000 jobs and how to get there. But before we do that, I think it's important to get a bit more context on each of the panelists. So let me start off with a yanda over question. Um, and this is not the easiest of questions. So 
Can I ask you, Yanda, in your view, um, what has government done right so far with regards to cannabis reform? Um, I mean, there are certain aspects we could probably praise them for, but also, you know, what is really critical to get right if we're going to enable and unlock the economy and access as a greater scheme? Um, thanks for the, for the question, Jeff. I mean, where does one actually begin to, to answer this? I think on the whole, the, the uh, stance towards cannabis has broadly been positive over the last couple of years. The, the how you actually sort of operationalize that sort of ambition is really where the challenge has been. And so over the last couple of years, I think we've had a sector that's been ca characterized by a lack of coordination and a very high degree of fragmentation within government. So that has made it very difficult to get something of a coherent kind of regulatory framework, which means at the moment you sort of got different pieces or different segments of the cannabis industry sort of moving in different ways. I think in, in some ways, SAPRA, uh, and as much as sort of they end up being the guys uh, on the receiving end of a lot of frustration, I think in some areas of sort of advanced um, cannabis, probably more than any of the other departments or agencies in allowing for medicinal cannabis, even with its restrictions. But I think they're much further ahead, including also liberalizing, obviously, hemp uh, and allowing for, for an exemption, which while it doesn't make sense, is still at least some step towards the, the right direction. I think the biggest win um, so far, at least from our perspective, is the liberalization of industrial hemp which I think was a, a, a major milestone given that lots of folks had been waiting for about 22 years for any kind of commercialization opportunity to arise. So that has been uh, a really great area. There is some, uh, the, the announcement by the Department of Justice around the commercialization of recreational cannabis, I think that's absolutely game changing. The vehicle through which they're trying to do it, um, the private purposes bill is not the, is not the right one to do it in. Um, for all sorts of reasons, including sort of constitutionality issues. But I think our, our, our panelists from Schindler's can sort of touch on some of those. Um, where I think they're really, the, in our mind, what really is needed to do is to try and consolidate and get a little bit more singularity around sort of the cannabis regulatory environment. Let's go actually for one major bill that allows you to solve a number of issues and cover the breadth, I think we're talking about, 11 or 12 different pieces of legislation. That's sort of where we need to really go. The unlocking, um, especially with the Drugs Act, I think is sort of a major, is a major challenge um, across the board, whether that's, you know, whether or not licenses or permits, even for hemp are legal or um, preventing the fund, uh, the flow of funds and fi traditional finance from being able to invest. These are some of the areas where we need quite uh, a bit of work still. And I think a lot of it is around let's we have sort of a big ambition but let's also remember that this is a very nascent industry and we need to sort of build up some kind of foundational building blocks before we can actually sort of think about these these grander ambitions so i'm very excited to get into the discussion about the achievability of the 130k target awesome excellent no, i would agree with your comment there i would say SAPRA has probably run of it uh, since uh, 2018, probably the most aggressively from government standpoint. I mean, there's even the director of food control that could be involved from, uh, you know, food stuff, disinfectant, cosmetics, you know, they regulate those industries, but they've been silent on the matter of, you know, consumer goods. Um, and let's be honest, agriculture eventually found it, uh, October, you know, getting commercialization going, but there's still some points which we're going to talk about today in terms of how to really enable the full value chain. Because uh, hemp just cultivated by itself, it serves little value. We're not looking at tertiary processing. So fantastic. I'm excited for what we're going to unpack and discuss. But let me throw it to TD because um, you're quite involved in terms of different regulatory areas across. Um, you've been to quite a few events uh, in Europe as well. How do you see it from, um, let's just call national governments or so the, the, the politicians uh, in different African countries? What is their perception in terms of uh, their view on cannabis? We've seen a few countries make some progressive moves. Malawi, uh, we've seen Zimbabwe pushing. Lesotho was the first to move as well on the continent. Uh, there's Zambia talking. There's Madagascar that's uh, very conservative. You know, there, there's all these different ideas. Tell us how you see it across the African continent and landscape. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Generally, I think there's a lot of conservatism in how a lot of governments and, and politicians have approached the cannabis topic. Um, and again, the conversations we have outside the conferences, off the formal um, 
uh, stage also quite different to the, what we see happening. Um, I think generally from an African point of view, it, most people have a story or have some understanding of the cannabis plant um, apart from the propaganda that has been channeled and, and spread over a very long time. So I think it's also an issue for leaders and policymakers to really conceptualize how to shift from the prior um, war against drugs approach to a more progressive approach. But I am encouraged by the fact that I think there are more discussions of this nature taking place. And what I have found is that the whole issue about the cannabis industry ties in quite well with a lot of the issues that um, member states are really seized with. They are really looking into sustainable approaches to agriculture and ways to modernize it. They're looking at ways to create jobs. They are looking at how to improve access to medicines. So within each of those um, projects and topics that are already ongoing, I think it's quite easy to throw in the, Af the, the cannabis element and bring that to the table for discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've always been a big proponent of African botanicals. I do believe this will be one of our major exports uh, for South Africa, for the rest of Africa. Going a decade forward, African botanicals, where cannabis is a vital component of that, is going to shape, it's, it's what is going to be a massive sector for the industry across the spectrum, from skeletium, cannabis, and the rest. And I, it's glad to, I'm glad to see Africa seizing the opportunity. I would like to see a stronger focus on local economy local access, local initiatives, this, this idea of just getting on board now to be the, if you were the eighth country in Africa to now export, that's not, not relevant. You know, there's, there's, there's this lack of relevancy because it's challenging. We've seen Colombia come on board as well. So it's about how do we improvise and move this industry forward? So talking about action on the ground, let's, let's go to Leslie because Leslie, you've been someone who's seized the opportunity from the medical standpoint, you implement it, uh, you know, a real strong focus on genetic cultivation. You've been highly successful with, uh, I mean, it's nearly almost a dozen, I think, uh, territories you've exported to, um, and some of them quite challenging to get into. So, so talk to us about the, you know, the feasibility of building Fallbridge, the implementation, a bit of the challenges, and uh, how you made it work to your advantage. Yeah, so, so we, we approach it to, like farmers, um, and... Um, we, we kind of went for the low-hanging fruit first. Uh, I think we, we've, we basically said to ourselves, well, if, if we're going to get into cannabis, let's just get this business scaled. You know, we see cannabis in two years or five years or 10 years being um, another crop, um, again, becoming highly commoditized with all this production that's coming on stream globally, with Colombia coming on stream, Spain in a few years, um, there's massive amounts of production, even in other African states. So our focus has been very much to scale up our business, to get it to a, um, um, the, the ability to produce high quality um, medical grade cannabis and at a low cost um, and, and, and build our markets from there. Um, and, and, and that's pretty much what we've done. We've supplied into markets where the regulations are not um, EU GMP, for example, they're more GACP, such as Switzerland. And, and that's let us scale up the business. And I can't stress how difficult it is to scale up a cannabis business. Um, we've made tons of mistakes and we're still making mistakes, but I'm hoping that as, as we uh, get into a level where we can get into more regulated markets, we've got the scale and the capacity to to, to just plug into those, to, to those countries. So it's, it's been a really, really difficult few years. And, and I think the, the thing that's sitting at the back of our minds, and I'm, I'm sure sitting at the back of everyone's minds on this panel, is you know, where the regulation's gonna go um, and, and how to enable the regulations to make it um, easier for us, not only to grow the product, but to access markets internationally. And I think this is also where SAPRA comes in, in, in getting its, um, or get, getting licensed growers here are recognized to be able to supply into developed markets like, like Germany and Israel and where, wherever the, the, the new markets will be opening up. So, so a lot of challenges, but like we, we, we see the opportunities here and, and we've approached this as what can we do quickly and get into markets because in two, three, five years time, those markets are going to be saturated and they're going to work with the guys that they know and um, we, we need to be there. Yeah, fully. 
No, I agree on that point of scalability. I mean, we've seen this across the US specifically, like the inability to market and advertise a business. I mean, we're looking to create a 100,000 jobs or more. We need to have businesses have traditional banking access. I mean, this is still highly restricted in the US. Uh, making a, a business relying completely on cash is not good for the IRS. It's not good for sustainability. It's not good for security on those sites. I mean, there, there's a couple of challenges. And I mean, a lot of this stems from things like the United Nations, which I know uh, TD can talk to in terms of, you know, a lot of the African countries look to policy. I mean, we've seen this with the Ukrainian conflict, you know, the, the ability of a central, you know, regulatory environment where it's almost adopted would help the rest of Africa develop. But I'm really interested in that, that aspect of marketing, how to drive it, how to develop it. I'll use an example for South Africa. I mean, a lot of medical patients are now getting access through Section 21, but you're not even allowed to advertise an unregistered medicine. So how do these companies actually go about talking about their products when it's not a registered marketing authorized medicine? There's a bunch to say there. And um, I want to throw this maybe to the legal side, which is uh, Dunmary. Uh, maybe give us a bit of context on Schindler's involvement in the cannabis space. And um, what are some of the main activities that Schindler's is focused on right now in terms of driving reform, improving access uh, and getting policy to work for us? Thanks for that. So just to give everybody some context, so Shunas is, as I've mentioned, of South Africa's first firm with a medical and recreational department. But this already started back in 2017 when we started representing the Jaha couple, which is um, an influential couple in South Africa for the cannabis space. And our firm applied to intervene in the Prince matter in 2017 in the, what came from the Western Cape High Court, which needed to move to the Constitutional Court. We applied to intervene there and we succeeded. And um, after months of preparation and getting some of the world's best top class experts on board, we were successful with our application to decriminalize cannabis for private consumption by adults in September 2018. Now, Shindus essentially focuses on five primary areas when it relates to cannabis advice. These include your corporate and intellectual property law, medical cannabis licensing and compliance. We've got our recreational cannabis law. And we also have the non-litigation, which involves maybe reviewing decisions by state functions, for example, or even doing stays of prosecution for people who might still be carrying cannabis-related um, arrests. Now, post the judgment, our engagement hasn't stopped. It hasn't been limited to clients only. So what we've also done as a firm is that we've made submissions both written as well as um, orally to Parliament in relation to the new private, private purposes bill. Now, what I would like to highlight here is just that it is a bill, it's not yet law, um, and that is to our benefit as we're still in the process of public participation. And that's what we took advantage of as a firm. So we wrote a public letter to, to Parliament, we've made submissions to Parliament in relation to the bill, and just with the legalities and constitutionality of certain aspects of the bill. So as, it, as some has already mentioned, there is concerns in relation here to, but more specifically, we are pushing from the start to have industry and regulation, which is going to both stimulate both local and international investments. There is a big conversation at the moment, especially within South Africa, with questions being raised, how is local entrepreneurs supposed to compete with international investment and how are they supposed to access the market? Um, and then, of course, we also have on the other side the legal red tape, as we have, we've just started to touch on as well. So there is a lot, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to discuss from the legal side. But as we've all also mentioned and pointed out, we've made a lot of progress. I think we mustn't lose sight of the fact that it was only in September 2018 that it was decriminalized. And as we've mentioned, other departments have taken up more than others. We do have certain legal challenges. As mentioned, the Drugs Act still defines cannabis it's an illegal, illegal substance, and it is still defines that as the plant and the whole plant or any portion of the plant. So that makes it quite confined. So um, Shunas's role has both been to be a voice for our clients, to be for the industry itself, to continue to help to develop the industry where possible, but also to take care of our clients' private interests. And what I mean by that is, is that, um, you know, 
courts are available to everyone. Although attorneys, we live, we breathe these things every day. It doesn't mean it's exclusively for us. Um, we represent quite a few NGOs and lobby groups that also then come to us and challenges these decisions by parliament, challenges these regulations moving forward so that we can continuously shape this as it's coming along. So we're hoping that that does make a difference as we go. And um, we've seen this as well. It's, it really is the conversations are being taken up. We are being taken seriously. Just um, as by way of example, the first engagement on the private purposes bill was very primary. It was very like high level. And it was actually still clouded with some confusion. We have to compliment Parliament on the second session of, of public participation in terms of the bill. It was a lot more scientific based. They started asking questions such as, will this be attacked in court? Will this hold up in a review application? And this is the questions that we want to be seeing Parliament being asked, because this is the questions that we've posed to Parliament. Please ensure that these regulations, that these laws will not be attacked, that they do not need to go through a court process. Because as we've pointed out, the more that we are slowed down, the longer it takes for us, for us to reach the international market and to reach our potential to get to those 130,000 jobs. I mean, in the last year, the US has been able to create over 100,000 jobs in the US alone. And I mean, that's quite something if you compare that to your, your financial sector, which created 140,000 formal jobs. So it really is starting to compete with other industries. Um, but as we've mentioned, it's about getting into the market, getting our regulations right so that we can, can really stimulate that investment and stimulate the interest that we've been receiving so far. No, awesome, 100%. I mean, and I think this also relates to a point of lobbying. And I think we can come back to this topic about lobbying because I looked at the comments on the Private Purposes Bill when it was reviewed in Parliament. And I was actually a bit stumped and shocked to actually see only 32 organizations and individuals that actually commented to Parliament. Uh, and I know who was on that list because I reviewed it closely and I looked at the comments and I was, it, for me, it was like, there needs to be this, this push from, you know, being an activist, being a lobbyist. Like, it's really important that people comment on that bill. I mean, I did it as a private individual, organizations did it. Like, if you, if you want to be in this industry, you as a citizen in this country have the right to email parliament and put forward your views on the private purposes bill. And it's very disappointing to see that since September 2020, when this was supposed to be ratified or implemented in some form, we're still waiting. And it's coming to almost four years. And, you know, I, I mean, I think it's really important that citizenry also understands that whatever shape the bill might have taken initially, and maybe in its infinite, infinite or when it was initially drafted, Yes, there was a lot of challenges, but remember, you having a ratified bill gives you a right. So, for instance, if there was an agreement on how much you could carry as an individual when traveling, that's a right. And the, to avoid the ambiguity of the law is really important. I mean, that's what we need to do is ratify certain measures. But I agree with you. We need to be comprehensive, inclusive. And we're going to talk about it because um, the longer we delay, the harder it is to formalize, standardize and create jobs. And to that point, Sibs, I want to bring you in here and maybe highlight here for you, you know, what has been encouraging because you've been involved and looking at different um, investment options, you know, as in whenever someone's putting capital into a business, there's, there's definitely the uh, due diligence that needs to go into it. There's the regulatory considerations that need to be addressed. Uh, it's not been easy because there's a lot of restrictions. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's definitely gray pockets everywhere you look. What have you seen that's encouraging that, you uh, maybe brings you to this, this sense that, you know what, in the next couple of years, we can create a very sustainable economic development for cannabis and low THC hemp. How does that look going forward for you? What's encouraging from what you've seen? I oh, said, you just saw mute there. Sorry. So I think to answer that question, we have to look at firstly, the medical cannabis uh, opportunity, which is going to be a much smaller opportunity. I think people need to, to be aware of that because it is um, a lot more technical. It requires a lot of capital. Um, as you mentioned, Supra has had a lot of pushback uh, because of uh, the fact that you have to develop a facility first before it gets audited and you get your license. And you know, um, you're talking in the range of at the very, very sort of minimum in terms of a functional facility that can export internationally, probably around that 20 million rand mark, even though you can build facilities for cheaper, but at the moment it will be quite difficult to, uh, to, to sort of enter export markets. Um, and, you know, a lot higher on, on, on the top end, you know, 100 million plus. 
Um, but we are starting to see some local uh, players now beginning to integrate into the international supply chain. Um, Falbridge is one of them, and they've been playing a pivotal role in terms of flying the South African flag high in international markets, showing that, um, you know, we can develop um, world-class products that can, you know, be supplied into international international into international markets. But we're also seeing other cultivators that are specialized in selling bulk flour, beginning to move product into Australia, into Israel, um, into Europe, uh, and so forth. And it's a slow start. Um, I think the one thing about especially on the medical cannabis side, is that it always takes two or three or four times longer than you anticipate because of the need to scale, because of the need to calibrate um, your sort of cultivation, uh, quality control, etc. But I think we are starting to see the emergence of some local players that we think will be, um, that have the potential to be global champions. Um, our view is that, that has to, there has to be an overlay of R&D, particularly on unique strain development, partnerships in terms of um, sort of mapping strains to different applications and so forth. So as mentioned across the, the webinar, uh, simply going for commodity play, I think is, uh, is, is a little bit more of a shorter term. Uh, you'll, you'll see you know, decent margins on the short term, but there'll be margin compression because of how much product is coming into, into the market. Uh, but I think what has been encouraging and frustrating at the same time has been the movements on the hemp side because I think we know that the potential that hemp holds in terms of the end products it can produce. Hemp has got a four times, uh, you know, an average higher CO2 absorption factor than, than most uh, uh, plants. Um, it's got, you know, um, so in other words, integrating hemp into, into a supply chain to produce products, bio, bio, um, plastic, biodegradable plastics, uh, textiles, biocomposites for cars, etc., uh, can significantly reduce the carbon footprint of uh, industries that we see today. So we've taken some steps in terms of the permits and so forth, um, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done for that to actually begin to, to, uh, to sort of gain steam and, and momentum. Um, so we're watching developments there quite closely. Um, we do realize that there's a lot of execution risk um, in terms of developing a, a large scale hemp supply chain, um, in terms of uh, cultivation based practice, um, mapping of different um, strains and cultivars to different parts of the country, um, uh, the processing equipment uh, and, and so forth and the manufacturing equipment. Um, it's, it's a long journey, but we are encouraged that by the fact that we've, we're taking the first tentative steps. Okay, awesome, excellent. Well, now we've heard from each of the panelists uh, on a bit of a, you know, their view on the industry. I want to get into now the brass tax, you know, like, how do we get to 130,000 jobs, you know, like, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to pose this to each of the panelists, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some purposes here. I, I want to know the distribution. How do you see it? And what are some of the stumbling blocks related to it? So specifically, we've talked about medical, we talked about industrial hemp, we talked about responsible adult use or recreational I mean, I often like to say pharmaceutical cannabis instead of medical, because I do believe medical cannabis as a whole has medical benefits. So I think the term medical cannabis is somewhat, you know, it's skewed even in the US. It's not seen as a marketing authorized product like an Epidiolex. So when we talk about medicinal cannabis, we really are looking at that prescription type. It will always, in my view, fall maybe 5% of the market. You know, realistically, if we look at how industries have matured in North America specifically and Canada, I think we need to start talking about, you know, we're going to get inclusion because the medical industry is not inclusive. I know because I come from the pharmaceutical world. Uh, as much as I like to talk about the industry, break it down, make it more accessible to the public so they understand how medicines get registered, how it gets to the public, it's always going to be that, that 5%. You know, it's never going to be where you're going to see the scale. And yes, the science in that region is so important to drive the benefits. I mean, I think the two, 2018 FDA approval for cannabinoid therapeutic really gave the UN and others that opportunity to start backing it. And it's always nice to have a scientific rationale for implementing uh, changes that might affect social reform, might affect certain policies, might go against the current. But I think a lot of countries have gone against the current with drug policy. So let's talk now, you know, how do you as an audience see it in terms of how do we get there? And what does the distribution look like between adult use in terms of potential dispensaries uh, that could be implemented and how that might look, and also the um, industrial side. Like, I know Yanda's probably going to have a lot to, to unpack on the industrial side, and I know that TD will maybe talk about policy. Uh, I know that Dunry will have a lot of legal cons, and I think uh, Desi can speak to uh, the broad range of it, because we've had some previous discussions that have been very uh, high level. 
And Sibs, I know you track global markets like I do. So let's maybe cycle back around in the same order. Let's go back to Yanda. Let's unpack 130,000 jobs. Give us maybe an estimation as well, everyone, on timelines. Like, could we do this in two years? Could it be achievable to drive that kind of growth in two years? It would require massive reforms. Uh, it would require a lot of adoption. But like, is five years more realistic? Give me a timeline and give me a distribution if you can. Uh, thanks for that, Jeff. Um, look, my perspective is, is uh, I suppose, is informed by having to like do industrial development uh, in, in many different uh, new categories, including in South Africa, uh, in like the niche uh, textiles fiber space. I think almost the question is not really so much about, you know, the 130,000, does it work, but actually what do you need to do in order to be able to get there? Now, for me, I think the first thing is really the timelines. This is not achievable, not even in five years, maybe in 10, okay? Um, and that's simply because in order for you to be able to build up this kind, this kind of like job-rich industry, there's a lot that you need to do in terms of building up certain kinds of capabilities, plugging in various holes. Um, you know, let's take, for example, the fact that if you get a, a permit from Dalrad, um, you're going to have to get a permit for every 50 hectares, right, that, that you're going to be growing. Now, how quickly do you scale that up, like from 50 to a couple of thousand? When you think that, and, and I hear the comparisons with the United States and with Canada, it's not pound for pound here because you're also, cannabis doesn't exist as an industry that's a vacuum, right? So you can say, well, if, you know, you can move that way and that country has done this, but it's because you have an enabling environment um, where other sectors, for example, already benefit, right, from there. We already have basic constraints in general, for example, in the agricultural industry that are also going to be the same kinds of challenges you have for, for hemp and cannabis. So I think there needs to be some kind of realism. I mean, let's give you an example of citrus. I mean, one of our big export crops, right? It's one of the, the biggest revenue um, earners. And I think we're like the second largest exporter of citrus. And that entire industry, I think we've has been in existence for about seven decades, exporting for the last four, and they have about a total of 120 or 130,000 jobs. So there needs to be like a, a real reality check about how you actually build up the blocks to be able to get there, starting off with sort of the low hanging fruit, the stuff where you can actually anchor capabilities that exist in other industries where you might already have a competitive advantage. You need to build up, but for us, it's like, it's lots of, it's lots of gaps, right? And I, and I wish almost that we'd taken an approach of, of saying, okay, not just like 130,000 jobs sort of plucked out of nowhere, but actually where are we landing, right? That justifies like the 130,000 jobs in like 10 years, because at the moment, I don't think we even have sort of the, the coherence around that because we, we can't assume that we're going to be competitive in cannabis in every single segment. It's not going to happen. And I think at the moment, sometimes the conversations happen and it's like, well, no, we, we, we go for everything and then somehow we'll be the best at it. And one, it, it, really, it really doesn't happen that when I, it's, it's so refreshing to, to be able to hear from Leslie talk about like the learning curve. It's really huge. We don't have a lot of areas. I mean, I get, um, you know, lots of engagements from uh, provin provinces where you've got growing of hemp and folks are sitting on hundreds of tons of biomass that actually can't be processed. Well, because there isn't that capability there. And even worst of all is that I hear a lot of folks talking about how actually the market is already there. Well, coming from the industrial hemp side, I mean, I'd like to know where exactly you think that market is because I would love to be able to send my members there. But the truth of the matter is this is an area where we actually might get government to usefully actually compact different partners to be able to create markets, you know? So a, a simple example would be that if let's say the government decided like the Chinese government, maybe not the best example for everything, but in this particular sector, just simply mandating the, that the uh, uniforms that are used by army personnel are going to be made from hemp, boom. That's a market. Private sector responds by saying, well, we need to actually create all the various bits and pieces in the chain that allows us to be able to actually meet that. So sort of start from the demand first and then work your way backwards, because I don't think that 130,000 is something that's achievable in five, seven. I think if we're looking 10, 15 years, 
And provided that we can get very basic things done around market development, making sure we can set up standards, for example, there are folks in medicinal cannabis right now who have everything, all the capital in the world, and still aren't able to, to like get a consistent certificates of analysis or struggling to get um, export permits, right? So they can send stuff to market. These are the these are the big stumbling blocks, by the way, when you're thinking about building things up from scratch. So what do we do sort of in those areas? And the big unlock for us is get the friggin' regulations sorted out and don't wait for like another year. We can't, we, we can't afford to wait for another season to go past and we haven't been able to do very much about this area. So let's think about the regulations first, but then very quickly, let's think about the market and then work our way backwards and what are all of the various things that we require and be also very targeted around where is the competitive advantage for South Africa in various product categories? It's not going to be everything. So I'm a little bit of a, not so much of a skeptic, but, but really a realist around what is actually achievable and some of the various things that are required to enable that. Awesome. No, I enjoy that. The, the, I like that example of China as well. I mean, textiles is probably the most complex side of industrial hemp in terms of getting it right because you really, you know, yeah, there's a lot you can compare with cotton and yes, it's superior to, to many degrees, but to get a fabric that doesn't irritate the skin it, it's no easy task. I mean, ask anyone in the US that's in agro-processing or hemp. That industry is actually still in its infancy when it comes to industrial use, less so the extraction. And, and that's really important because people just see this farm bill from 2018 in the US and like, it's all going to be amazing. And I would say to that point on mandates, I mean, it would be fantastic to see something like from government, maybe on RDP housing and sustainable uh, plastic substitutes, you know, like get practical. Like if we're going to allow for hemp processing, where is the agro-processing? I mean, I've heard of one decommissioned facility in Winterton. Like, we need to then enable, government needs to push for agro-processing so that there's a reason that these collective farmers can go up into an area for processing. And what are we going to process? We're not going to make t-shirts. That's just not practical. That, that, that industry is five years plus off. You know, it would take quite a lot to go. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I know Leslie mentioned as well earlier, you know, it's one way, it's so much, I mean, there was a discussion about registered crops. I mean, let's get cannabis registered before we can even talk about IP because that's a part of what Schindler's does, but we need IP protection if we're going to now improve genetics, focus on, you know, what are we cultivating hemp for? So I love that idea. I love that comparison because it really is, it's something that simple about getting, you know, industry involvement, government involvement, and we need to move. We've lost too many seasons. So let's, let's kick this agenda. So let's move around now to TD. TD, where do you see it in terms of uh, distribution? I'm getting a feeling, and I'll probably also agree with it, that 130,000 drops is steep. Uh, the one contrast I would say is, let's ask the question as well, maybe we'll factor this in, how many people are currently employed informally in the illicit side of cannabis? Because if you work it out, there's about 38 million adults in, in South Africa. And if you look at consumption rates of cannabis, it gives you a leaning to like, hey, maybe there's a, there's a lot of people out there. I think also the definition of a job or a sustainable employment is a, is a big point because Africa won't have the level of automation that the US and, and China and other areas have. So maybe more jobs per hectare uh, is realistic. But again, it's not the type of jobs I think a lot of people want to see. It's a start, but we need to drive to higher end jobs like we see in Canada and the US market. So TD, to you, talk us through how you see the split and uh, how you see the, uh, the distribution of numbers. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, my, my view is I also agree with Ayanda regarding the timeline, <clears throat> just based on previous experience and looking at where we are, and by that I mean broadly South Africa and Lesotho, and just from my experience in Lesotho from 2017, it is still a, quite a big challenge to get accurate data regarding how many jobs have been created since um, the cannabis uh, licenses have been issued and to be able to determine to what extent has the cannabis industry um, impacted positively on Lesotho's economic performance. So I think there are still challenges around data collection and getting information which would enable us to make such predictions on how much would recreational or adult use cannabis contribute um, in terms of job creation, in terms of economic impact and so on. So it's always a bit tricky to give a firm answer. Um, but that said, I do believe that there is definitely a um, big scope to, to aid um, job creation through the cannabis industry. And specifically what I've seen is, again, with, with reference to my Lesotho experience is that there've been a lot of 
uh, strategic al al alliances or allegiances that have been formed, which I think have um, really benefited parties on both sides from Lesotho companies collaborating with South African companies, but also during the 2017-2018 um, years, there was a lot of uh, participation from Canadian-based companies and Israel-based companies, which I think also contributed immensely to the development of Lesotho's cannabis industry, both in terms of know-how, access to the global markets, um, as well as um, compliance support with standards and requirements, and also to the extent that it was possible for them to also engage and to reach out to regulators and um, policymakers, because I think because they're coming from more mature markets, um, their insight will be different to what you would maybe normally come across in a report. And again, I think there's definitely much to be said about one-on-one -on -one engagement um, versus really trying to push um, policymakers to, you know, read certain recommended um, uh, texts, which I think we're all familiar with. So for those reasons, um, I, I do think it, it will contribute largely to employment. However, it is quite hard to give a better estimate. Um, and relating to what you said as well regarding the pharmaceutical industry, I do agree that it, it's always it, it's it's a very uh, it's a very expensive um, area in terms of the cannabis industry, which most people um, will not have access to or be able to participate in simply for the high costs, the, the high standards that need to be met, the consistency that's required. Um, however, I still do encourage many to go through that line because we do have a huge problem on the continent in terms of um, the development of local medicines, traditional medicines, and also access to affordable, effective medicines as well. And just, you know, looking at the COVID pandemic, um, cannabis has been shown to, to assist with the inflammation and other symptoms. So I think there is scope to delve into the medical um, aspect and to expand on that. Um, I also support developments in hemp and um, just from discussions I've had broadly with policymakers on the continent is I think the the one of the critical issues that I've uh, come across is that whole issue about the percentage of THC. I think the other problem is really getting people to move away from that because that creates a lot of complications on how will it be extracted, what kind of seeds are we going to need, um, it, globally, we've seen in the EU and the US, it's a huge problem. So it's a question of, okay, do African members um, set a different um, percentage from the get-go that can be applied across the board, or is, is a more flexible um, approach required? And again, um, hemp has so many spin-off industries that I think that speaks for itself in terms of what it, that will do for um, job um, creation. And adult use, um, that is usually the more controversial one, and that takes us back to the UN treaties and so on. Um, and that probably needs a whole different um, discussion altogether, but I do believe that the UN treaties do have sufficient scope for countries to be able to, to um, pursue an adult use um, industry, which I believe that is where a lot of people will participate in. And um, lastly, I just also want to add and emphasize the importance of the development of local markets, because I think, it, I mean, it's understandable that a lot of companies are gearing themselves to export. However, I don't, I'm not sure how sustainable that is. And looking at the trends on the African continent, population growth, the African free trade um, agreement, I think there's potential to really um, benefit from the cannabis industry, but in the sense of promoting inter-African trade. And lastly, lastly, um, I also would like to highlight the importance of um, not just necessarily looking towards job creation, but also reform to create an enabling um, environment where people that have already been using cannabis as a, as a cash crop to support their livelihoods should also be able to do that um, outside the bounds of being um, employed. Um, that should also be an option as well. Thank you. No, oh, awesome, 100%. I mean, we've seen New York try to do this in terms of a more integrative approach for inclusion in terms of uh, you know, previously disadvantaged to members of society related to cannabis prosecutions. So, I mean, it's completely doable. On the point of the recreational, I mean, we saw an organization, uh, FAAAT, release a publication called High Compliance that specifically addresses how to, it's a very good read. I'm not all the way through it. It's, uh, I think, two weeks out now, but it addresses working of the UN treaties 
on how to integrate uh, a responsible adult use market. I love it. And on your point regarding low THC cannabis hemp, fully 1% is maybe an initial benchmark. I think a lot of countries have gone with Czech Republic. Um, Malawi's done it. Uh, we've seen Switzerland do it. We've seen uh, Colombia define psychoactive as 1% as well. I mean, it's the list just keeps ticking over on the 1% list. And I think it's fully uh, rationalized for, for Department of Agriculture to really address the 1%. Because at the end of the day, if you put it into materials uh, for construction, if you put it into substitutes, what's the risk? You know, like really the risk of diversion is ridiculous. And I mean, it also addresses the point you raised about testing. I mean, to test for a 0.2% limit, we agree that there is no proficiency testing established between labs. I mean, it's already too uh, obstructive getting standards to laboratories. I mean, who's going to import a standard for testing and then consume that when it's so much more expensive than even medicinal cannabis? I mean, a standard, a reference standard is probably the most expensive form of a, of a cannabinoid uh, if it's a THC reference. I mean, no one's going to buy that for diversion. It's ridiculous. So SAPRA restricting permission for labs to test by itself is ludicrous. So for me, so many good points in all of this. I mean, there's so many ways you can go on this. But now we're going to throw it to Leslie because... Uh, Leslie, you've been active in the space. I mean, let's maybe kick it off as well in terms of you're an employer in the market, you're growing rapidly. Talk us through your current employments, you know, scaling and how you see you as an organization going. And keep in mind for the audience that uh, we're near 60 commercial licenses, not nearly all as successful as Fallbridge, but it might give us some idea about the scope of the medical growth. And if that's fractional compared to industrial and recreational adult use, then it gives us some kind of barometer. Yeah, so we're on um, 40 full-time employees at the moment. And I think as soon as we scale up to our full production potential, we'll be on about 120. Um, you, you know, we also have a few segments of the business. One of the other segments is the um, distribution of genetics, where we import seed. We distribute that to uh, local uh, license holders, both hemp license holders and to, to medical cannabis license holders. And then we're also... Um, uh, producing uh, sterile tissue cultures. So we import the material, we propagate it at our facility, and we can um, distribute that to um, local and overseas license holders. Um, so we, we see a lot of potential in, um, in, in all of these segments. Um, to, but, but to give you an example, we sit in a position where we, we're importing um, seed and we're a member of the National Seed Organization locally and we can't produce the seed locally. I want to produce seed locally. Of course, we can make it so much more cheaper than bringing the seed in uh, and, and creating more jobs there. But again, you know, it's, it's, it's a narcotic. Um, you, you need um, a hemp permit to be able to produce the plants outdoors to, to make the seed. And uh, it's not a registered crop. So I can't get, I can't get the seed um, certified to be able to sell it um, internationally because I can't get a phytosanitary certificate for it. It, it. It's just a whole host of little challenges that, that just add up and, and you're kind of stuck at the end now and we, we, we can't even start the process. So a, a, again, it's, it's going to come back down to all the regulations and we, we sit in a position where if our, an example is Switzerland. You know, they, they've not only like taken the limit to 1%, but they've already mapped out where medical is going to be. So they're releasing their medical regulations, I think on, on the 1st of August, and there's great apologies for being a month late or two months late. And, and it's going to be very, very clear exactly what's going to be happening. They've, they've all started the dialogue in terms of recreational. So, you know, where, where are we? Like we're sitting years behind, unless we get the regulations out, get it published, get it approved, you know, get the bill passed. And, and then I, I'm, I'm like, confident the jobs will come if the regulations are clear enough. If we know today that hemp can be grown at 1%, uh, I think it makes, a lot, uh, may, makes us a lot more comfortable to invest further to, to, to enable um, you know, growing the hemp sector. So um, you know, I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, I mean, you know, we're sitting where we're a little bit hamstrung in trying to grow our business because the regulations haven't quite caught up to where we are. So our focus has been very much exports, where I would rather be supplying that locally. Uh, I, I think, and then, and then there's new segments in the value chain that start waking up all of a sudden. There's research, there's education, there's um, finance. You know, there, there's so many different aspects. 
Let us never forget, I mean, South Africa is one of the biggest exporters of cannabis globally. It's just black market. So, you know, what, what's, what's going on here? You know, we were actually producing one of the biggest producers, yet we struggling to formalize it. And, and that, that just speaks again back to the regulations that, that are just not there yet. So. No, awesome. Awesome. Struggling to formalize it. I think that's the, that's the takeaway message here. And I think I, I agree with you there. So then apologizing for being a month or two or late. Uh, late. Uh, we, we leave it to the very last and then we still don't um, enact fully. And um, I agree with you. Switzerland's good at mapping it. I mean, they got the cantons involved. They piloted the uh, adult use model. Uh, they, they, they based it on science. They're basing it on, you know, different partners putting inputs into the value chain. And I mean, on your points of IP for the crop, I mean, if this is going to be such a big industry and if uh, politicians keep uh, spouting their proponents of the industry and keep addressing it in SONA, I mean, I hope they all watch this webinar because I think they need to listen to the industry experts. And I mean, expert is a bit of a strong word, but I think we all have spent enough time, enough sleepless nights pushing for reform here uh, that we've, We've wanted to see this growth. We've we've studied it. We've looked at it. We say, how can this happen? You know, and I think it's so important that um, I'm very concerned to see politicians pushing agendas for you know radical trans. Uh, you know, I've seen it in Zimbabwe as well, pushing heavily for him. But where's it going to go? Like, how many people are going to stop growing one crop in favor of him, and then they're going to end up shirtless, literally, because they can't even make the shirts from him. So I mean, this is the challenge: is politicians have a resp responsibility to the who elects them. To be informed when they make decisions. They really do. And I, I will be sending webinars for stakeholders and I encourage anyone who does once it's published to do the same. But let's now address what has been mentioned by everyone is the regulatory stumbling block. Let's talk about legislation. Dunmary, like what needs to happen here? If we're going to enable jobs, uh, let's go to you on the, the, the regulatory side and then we're going to go to SIPS uh, to give us some of that uh, enthusiasm we know SIPS for, that constant uh, voice of enthusiasm in the industry. But how do we get this to happen? So Dunry, take it off. Sure. Um, I think I can just start off by saying we, we desperately need a, a commitment by Parliament. And like Leslie has just highlighted, if the regulations are sound, the investors will follow, the jobs will come. But if we cannot get into that process, it really is just going to create this constant struggle. And what I mean by that is by creating regulations which are not sound, creating regulations which is not directed to a specific market, directed to create demand and feed demand, will essentially just discourage investment at the end of the day. But more than that, it will actually encourage disputes. And what we mean by that is, so for example, the regulations that was created with regards to complementary medicines was regarded yesterday by the Supreme or the day before by the Supreme Court of Appeal as not being valid. So if you have started creating a complementary medicine in line with the regulations, you've just found out this week it, was, it wasn't necessary, right? Yeah. So because it's all going to change, it's been challenged and moving forward. So what, that is exactly what I'm referring to. We need to create regulations which are sound. Even if they are attacked in a, in a review process or in a court process, it needs to stand up for itself. It needs to stand on its own two feet and go... Yes, um, it might not be a perfect scenario for one sector of the market, but in general, it is reasonable, it is logical, it feeds a market, it's there to, to speak to certain demands and keeping people safe. I need to point out that, you know, we're kind of in a bit of a, of a catch-22 position when it comes to regulation as well. A lot of people are very opposed to regulation. We encourage safe products. At the end of the day, you do not want a product on the market which is grown on the minefields or anything like that. We do want certain levels of security for safety. That being said, also regulations and creates regulatory bodies and regulatory bodies create jobs. So we also need to be mindful of these things that these regulations in themselves also do create jobs by regulatory bodies. But if we can find a policy that is effective and efficient in its application, this can run. It really can. I believe that I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic. Five years, maybe a bit short, just because as I've mentioned, it just, these things come out, they are challenged. Even the private purposes bill, how long has that taken to get to a first draft? It was immediately attacked, and in my opinion, rightfully so in various areas. 
And now we're back. We have to go back to public participation. They're in a second round of public participation now, and we're still not anywhere near an act, at least not that I'm aware of. So these sorts of things are really needs a commitment by government to give us sound regulations. I mean, as we've mentioned, the medicinal side is very expensive. It's highly, highly regulated. And even if you have a license, it doesn't even necessarily mean that you can create an end product. Your license conditions can limit you to say that you're only entitled to grow the bud in the bud itself. You can't process the bud into a joint. You can't process it into anything. It has to be the dry bud, dry packaged and shipped overseas. So even if you do make those investments, you need to have sound advice as well to make sure that, the, that what we have at the moment can support your business plan as well. Because the industry is very limited, as we've explained. So in the medical side, very limited. You need to ensure all of your licenses are in place, your permits are in place. And, you know, if it's not, you do stand to lose your license and you stand to lose whatever progress you've made so far. And the investment that you've made so far, as Sips has pointed out, if you have a SARPRA facility, it needs to be in place before the license is issued. And even after it's issued, if you step out of line, you can lose that investment. So it's very important for you to make these decisions and understand them. From the recreational side, we are excited to hear that they are considering a commercial side of that. But that being said, presently at the moment, the constitutional court judgment was the catalyst for, for all of this. It started it, it, it was wonderful, but it does very, very, very clearly state there, not for sale, for personal private purposes. And that in itself is fantastic. It does give people right to access cannabis, um, you know, in a legal manner to grow it for themselves, um, whether it be for medicinal or recreational reasons. Um, that being said, however, the moment that you are found to be exchanging this for some level of remuneration, you are putting yourself at risk. And this doesn't just include you doing cash for crop, you know, this includes you giving away cannabis in exchange for other services or giving away cannabis in exchange for goodwill. So that's why people need to be extremely careful as well, and which is suffocating the industry at the end of the day. I mean, as we've mentioned, there is a lot of illicit substances or, or markets out there, you know, and, and the, I think the legal market is not necessarily going to solve that, as we've seen with other international markets. Instead, what we need to find is some way to create policy that will encourage that market naturally. So that it becomes, you know, a better decision, a more natural decision for you to go to the legal market versus the black market for commercialization. So, and then, of course, we have hemp. Yanda has really taken everything so well and, and pointed all of the issues out so well there. It's really is in its infancy at this point in time. Um, getting getting your any response to your application has taken a while. Lots of people have submitted in October already and only started receiving responses at this point in time. Some have given up. Um, so, you know, and, and that in itself is discouraging. If you as a farmer is, is interested in the, in the commercial hemp market and you're taking an interest and it's taking so long just for you to understand the process and to get the permit and then understanding afterwards maybe that it, that it doesn't really give you much of a value chain unless you develop it yourself. So the, all of these things need to be in the back of your mind when you want to get into the industry. And it, it really is going to take um, a fundamental effort by, by government to find something sound, but more importantly, to put that into logical, sound scientific discussions and outcomes so that if it is attacked, it can stand up to itself in court and review applications and the industry can keep running instead of, you know, submitting really wafty regulations, which is going to be attacked, not going to inspire investors, not going to inspire the industry to move forward. Awesome. I mean, this is such a good panel. I mean, I have to say this is turning out to be one of my favorite conversations about like just the industry and the sector. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the complementary medicines uh, ruling this week. I mean, that, that's a massive, uh, it's good and bad depending on how you see it, but it's a great, it's great to show like we've got to figure out the policy because it can be overturned so quickly and people could have sunk money into a project, an idea, a concept of the entire time doing it because it's good to see these things finally seeing the court decision. And to that point, the Hayes Club, I mean, can we get a ruling on private clubs? I mean, really, how long are we going to delay, postpone, try to figure out the regulatory framework in the background? Let's just get a ruling. Because then, it, then we have some precedence here in terms of where we're we going. Like, let's get a decision because that would probably give us a lot of clarity on like what is a legal form uh, around the privacy and how to utilize that. So, I mean, there's such there's such so many ways we can go on this discussion. I'm really keen to get to this, and I think if there's time, let's talk maybe about a responsible use model as a question. But Sips, let's give it to you because I'd like to hear your side in it. Um, 
where you stand on this viewpoint. Um, so far, this has just been such an amazing discussion. And I mean, uh, this can keep going for all night, if it's my opinion. But I know we're going to get to a point where we've got to have to bring in um, some of the questions. So, Serbs, let's hear from you. Sure. So, look, I think the 130,000 uh, jobs is, is definitely going to be a very long term uh, project. Um, uh, you know, it's not, it, to Ayanda's point, I, I don't think it's anywhere in the next five years. Uh, not even 10, my viewpoint is sort of more 15, 20. Um, and I think the, the big challenge with hemp is that, um, you know, unlike other, you know, sort of um, uh, focal industries for the government where South Africa tends to have exceptionally actually good policies, good plans, good, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, roadmaps on paper, but then fails in the execution. Uh, and, and that's where we see challenge challenges with hemp, we already sort of, you know, having a lot of challenges in the formulation first step um, in terms of um, uh, in terms of laying the, the the framework under which this industry can be built and scaled and so forth. And it, I mean, it is a complicated industry, so you can understand why governments uh, can struggle to sort of be coherent in terms of how to roll out the industry, how to sort of think about different considerations and impact so many different straight stakeholders uh, and, and so forth. But for me, it does feel that we sort of missing that ability to um, aggregate, you know, global best practice, um, you know, sort of a strong understanding of the local uh, socioeconomic dynamic um, and really sort of calibrate our approach to be practical um, to, you know, to meet the, for example, safety concerns uh, around cannabis for consumers, uh, for minors in terms of recreational, et cetera, but also to create a, um, a platform for entrepreneurial, uh, uh, you know, sort of energy and, and talent to really give it a good shot in the space, um, you know, to create an environment where investors um, can have a level of confidence of saying, look, this is, uh, from what I'm seeing, this is actually a really encouraging, uh, you know, sort of uh, place and, and I want to, you know, put some capital behind this and so forth. So, um, I think um, that first step is, is critical and I think a lot of the panelists have sort of uh, touched on some of the key components of ensuring that we can get at least a framework that is practical and that works. Um, but then from there, I think um, the, um, the need for sort of smart public-private po uh, engagement and partnerships, I think, will be quite critical, um, particularly because of the large um, the long history of traditional communities that have grown this plant, dependent on this plant, who need, who have to be taken along this journey for it to be sustainable. I don't think it's an option for it to be purely, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, um, geared towards just a, a capitalist uh, approach that doesn't have an inclusive uh, component to it, which is challenging. It's not an easy puzzle to be to, to put together. Um, but I think once we sort of begin to at least get the framework right or, you know, sort of uh, in, in a place where uh, there's that element level of confidence, we sort of focus on a domestic uh, industry, which which would actually attract foreign direct investments. We talk to investors in the US and Europe and uh, the UK, even in Asia, who are sort of waiting for enough of enough confidence to say look i'm willing i want to come into south africa once i know that you know in five years time there's going to be you know half a million patients uh, that are using cannabis grown from local um, sources and you know there's promise around ip that can be developed in south africa um you look at the incredible work that south africa has done in hiv and aids research and uh, you know breakthroughs within that space that same energy those same resources put into mapping the uses of cannabis to combat various um, uh, ailments and, and so forth can have breakthroughs that can actually be um, internationally relevant. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it, it's not an easy puzzle to put together. But as I said, I think, um, firstly, just getting that roadmap in place that uh, that is practical, that is, is, is not too cumbersome for, for commercial activity. Um, we've spoken about the removal of cannabis from the Drugs Act is an important step, I think, um, creating the right for, um, environment for entrepreneurs to want to take risks in this industry, but not feel constrained on day one. And then for investors to want to back that, um, I think is, is sort of the um, uh, sort of confluence of, of, of elements that can really propel this industry uh, forward. No, awesome. I, I enjoy that. I mean, 
Um, I'm going to encourage anyone uh, in the uh, participation side on the uh, viewers, please submit a question, include that there. I'm going to raise another question from my side. And this relates to the uh, points of two things, access and inclusion, right? So the first thing, and I've been a big proponent of medical cannabis um, because it is my background, but the second point, and I know this, is let's get ourselves through Section 21 to a point where we're already probably at about almost 500 patients. At what point does it take us 2,000 patients or 3,000 patients for us to now go and say to lobbyists, like, why is it that individuals with access to capital, who may be in the historic advantage, has access to every the plant that everyone should have access to legally, but the rest of us don't? So for me, I know what comes on the back of success in the medical aspect side is that we're going to lobby more successfully for responsible adult use. Now, when we talk about responsible adult use, um, I think a lot of the jobs in North America are stemming from this dispensary model, the bad tenders, uh, the aspects around storefronts. Um, you know, there is this, uh, how do we introduce it successfully? And if we do introduce it, how do we make it inclusive? Um, and I've got my own views. I mean, for me, I see it as, well, South Africa's done a good job in what area? Well, we've done a good job with ensuring there's quality for medicinal products. So what would it take to take that model, to have it that we now look at a more inclusive participation on retail licenses or dispensing licenses, that then, you know, whether this should be with SAPRA, whether this should be completely removed into an independent authority for cannabis based on experts in the field that understand the dynamics, the need for consumer safety, the need for bringing social parties into it. Like, maybe that's the way. Maybe we've got all these 60 licenses that are just not going to be as competitive as they thought they were going to be. Uh, they're not, they can't be all successful as Fellbridge. They're going to struggle against Colombian competition. They're going, to cons they're going to struggle against all these markets. So how do we get them to be inclusive on the dispensing side, so we make dispensing more accessible. We put some restrictions on age, the rest in there. We know that we're getting quality inputs. We can then enable testing so that at least we can now look at how do we get sourcing from these sites to the public so they have access. And then how do we get inclusion? How do we get individuals to come as a co-op? Because South Africa is known for co-ops. How do we get government to enforce some retail taxation to subsidize testing, which is going to be needed to allow for inclusion so we can have co-ops come into a central aggregator for testing and say, here's our 10 kilograms. We put a minimum to it. We, we know that's the requirement for testing. If it passes, we get to go into the existing uh, distribution chain, which allows access and inclusion. And if it doesn't pass, well, then it's not deemed fit for use, it's destroyed. And that's rules by everyone can play by because we care about some safety. And then forming the barometer on where the testing levels are is maybe a point of discussion. But I think that's what needs to start happening for us to see more jobs to see general access for us to follow with trends because going through section 21 for you to be a legal user of a cannabis formulation or flower is, is, is almost preposterous. So like while we have customers or people putting in actual questions, maybe can I get a quick view on like, what is the best model for including or enabling adult use? You know, I mean, there are two extremes. There's the one of use what we've got and what we've done right and maybe formalize it better for the public so that it's controlled. Um, how controlled is the debate, but there should be safety. Um, and then the other point is, do we completely scrap what we've done? Do we look at, you know, like a completely new model? What are the risks maybe with that? What are the benefits? Uh, so let's run around. Uh, I'm going to kind of run in the same string so everyone can prepare their thoughts. Uh, Yanda, I know you've been active in this point uh, as well. You know, we'll, uh, so let's run around. Uh, I'm going to kind of run in the same string so everyone can prepare their thoughts. Uh, Yanda, I know you've been active in this point uh, as well. You know, uh, so let's run around. Uh, I'm going to kind of run in the same string so everyone can. Sorry, yeah. the relay here. Uh, I don't know if everyone yeah. else is hearing the relay as well. Okay, it seems to have disappeared. So, yeah, it's your call. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. I mean, look, th this is something that's like top of, top of mind for us. Um, you know, the, I think there are definitely different kinds of ways of thinking about inclusion. I think the, the routes around sort of the recreational is one of the, one of the many. Um, but if we're speaking specifically around this, I actually, I'm quite a big, um, you know, personal fan uh, of like private clubs, especially if you have like private clubs that could have some sort of localized sourcing um, that would integrate, for example, farmers that are in traditional growing areas, for example. I think you might be able to, for example, get uh, inclusion that way. I think on the dispensary side, I mean, to be honest, I think I hear a lot around how large that market um, could potentially be. 
I, I'm not sure. It depends also on sort of the regulations, right? Because for example, in the even in like California, where like most of your sales are happening in the black market, like overwhelmingly because the regulatory burden is so high. So I'm not sure if that's if that's really um, around the the thing that sort of enables it. I think where you might kind of see um, a little bit more kind of interesting areas of like enabling inclusion might actually be in the in distribution, for example, that is often sort of an area we don't really talk about. And actually most of the, the people who are involved in the chain uh, or who are employed are, tend to be the guys who are actually taking the product and moving it from one place to another, not just like the, the folks who are growing sort of um, uh, uh, just at cultivation level. So I, I, I think there's an opportunity to be a little bit inclusive around the dispensary model, but I think it's not around picking one model or another, it's around how does that model itself like ensure that it entrenches like principles of inclusion in it and becomes very creative around how you make sure you can, you know, do stuff like responsible, like sourcing and like procurement. There are different kinds of ways of, uh, 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 of thinking about it. Where the government actually ends up landing on this, I think is going to be, is going to be an interesting one because the, 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 the question sort of in my mind still is what do those distribution channels like look like for, the like traditional medicines right or like um stock that comes from uh traditional growers is that going to be the same um is it going to be the same kind of standard um that you're applying across the board i'm not sure i think i think there we, we have to sort of think about this also with a view of what might some of the unintended consequences be around sort of limiting one area or another but just to say i i'm very much a big fan of the of the dispensary model Provided that we're not talking about dispensaries that are just sort of sitting in places like Cape Town um, and in, in Johannesburg and Santin that are actually not, not even themselves accessible to like populations, right? So I think it, we also need to be kind of uh, mindful around sort of how does that, that model work? And if you're sitting, for example, in, in Gauteng like I am, um, there's a big thing around sort of how does that get integrated into the township economy, right? Uh, which is something that's really, really very relevant for us. So I don't have sort of a, a clear cut cut answer around sort of where the kind of the big unlocks are. I have some hypotheses around the areas to be able to look at, and the the kind of some of the models that we have, I think actually could could be transformed uh, in a way that can actually drive the sort of you know benefits that we want from like livelihoods or inclusion, etc. Yeah, fully. I mean, it has to be tiered. You've got to look at the different social economic impacts fully. Like I don't think one model will ever work. Uh, it's one where we've got to look at multiple models and the private models work so well to a large extent Barcelona, Catalonian region. I mean, there's a lot of good stories out of the region uh, and it's good to compare that with maybe a more traditional US dispensary type of model. So good. Um, uh, I know I'm going to pass it around. So TD, let's have you pick it up. Uh, let's see how many minutes we can go. Yeah, because uh, Serbs and the rest of the team, I know there were some questions on RDP housing. I think we've spoken to that in terms of industrial hemp to some extent. Let's hear from the rest of the panelists. I know that, TD, you're quite involved in drug policy, so I'd like to hear your view on adult use. Okay, thank you, Jeff. So actually, there's a paper I've written with an old professor of mine at UCT, Professor Andrew Hutchison, that addresses this specific question um, within the South African context. So I hope to share that soon. And from that paper, just to briefly touch on what we looked at, we basically looked at borrowing from other existing models. We looked at Uruguay, we looked at Canada, um, but we've also looked at um, similar industries in the South African context, such as tobacco and alcohol, and how those are regulated and what can also be borrowed from those industries um, in terms of what are the responsibilities and, and duties of at national level as well as provincial level, and really just trying to set up a framework that works for the South African context, because again, it has existed for many years and it is persistent. So you're better off trying to create a regulatory framework that adapts to the reality on the ground than trying to shift everyone from the current systems. So just to be brief, that is what we're working on. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that point. It's really pervasive. So to try and put in, you know, stamp your own kind of uh, rules and systems on it. Agreed. I like it. Uh, let's jump. Uh, Leslie, your view? We, we would we would way rather be supplying the local market than the export market. Uh, and I, I just wish the, the, the regulations were there to, to, to facilitate that. I, I think we're, like, I love what Ayanna was talking about. 
Um, the, the only issue I have is, you know, you know we, we, we're held to, uh, as a licensed medical producer, we, we're, we're held to like a really high standard where when I'm producing one kilo or 1,000 kilos, I still need to get full testing on the product, which can cost us upwards of 30,000 Rand, you know, just to produce a COA to show that this product is completely safe. And, and I think, you, you know, when, when you're not doing that, then you, there is the potential for other problems. You know, you get product safety issues start to come up. Um, so, so when it comes to inclusivity, I, I'm like, I, I'm of the opinion that, you know, this, the, the value chain has got a lot of links in it and cultivation is just one aspect of it. And strangely enough, it's the smallest aspect. Ayanda was 100% right, distribution. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I hate to use the analogy, but you know, in, in, the, in the illicit game, the biggest guys were the guys that moved it, not the guys that grow it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in the same way in South Africa, in a legal framework, in a, in a, in a completely compliant way, um, the inclusivity is going to be in getting it from the farm gate to the, to the end user um, in, in, a, in a responsible, safe way. Uh, that's just my two cents. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah, fully agree. I mean, it goes to the whole narco model. You know, it's not so much about plant touching as plant facing. Uh, and this is the reality. That is how economics works. I mean, look at Amazon. Uh, look at the, the distribution hubs. I mean, this is where the market is, the value, the jobs, it's in those spaces. But it's all pinned by regulatory understanding. So, uh, Dan Marie, let's take it from you. Well, I think I'm just going to touch um, briefly on what everybody has highlighted already. I mean, there is there is frameworks that we can refer to. I mean, if you look at the alcohol regulations alone, there's regulations for those who produce it, those who transport and those who distribute it. And we, I can't see why that can't work in our industry, for example. Um, that being said, you know, I mean, when, when alcohol licenses started, some some firms actually just stopped with normal legal work and they just started specializing in alcohol licenses because they would just submit and get them through right and it, it really was just this concept of as long as you meet certain regulated principles and you meet certain tick boxes you can get your alcohol license and provided you don't step out of line you can keep that license and it can be it won't be revoked and there's regulatory bodies attached to that so there is definitely frameworks that we can fall back onto to to help guide us but i also think it's it's like we've pointed out inclusion is also you know various things it's Previously disadvantaged groups, it's those who don't necessarily have the income to enter into the industry, um, all of these sorts of things. And I think what's also important to remember is that there is certain um, provisions made in the past. This is not a, a new problem, meaning that those farmers struggling to get finances to put out cash crops, whether what that crop is is not a new issue. There is social development as well. There's programs for government that's already been established to assist. And I think it just needs to extend further and into these industries. And that comes back to, straight back to our conversation of once the sound regulation is in place, we can push for those industries to be included in social development. So we can give farmers to the previously disadvantaged, teach them to grow beautiful cannabis in South Africa and enter into the value chain. Um, but that is all going to come down to, once again, that dedication that we need from government to make this push in our country so that we can also, from a citizen side and from an investor side, then also re reciprocate by accepting this market um, more fully. I mean, if you look at the conversations from parliament and private parties, there is still that stigma attached. I think everybody who's worked in this industry can confirm that. If you look at how government put up the, the private purposes bill, it's very defensive. It's like, you know, don't go near kids, don't, do, you know, store it in any different way, which is quite laughable because, I mean, I've, we've never seen anybody complain about a bottle of wine and the kids power aid together in the fridge, right? So um, at the end of the day, it, it really just comes down to, to us um, understanding where the issues of inclusion is and we can address them with each in sub sector instead of just trying to address it above, um, as one issue alone. Awesome, 100%. Well, with that, I have to say this has been an amazing panel. I mean, I'm looking forward to the next webinars the next discussions um, to everyone out there watching who watches even after the event, like just keep doing your research, keep looking into the industry. I mean, this is, uh, I do believe African botanicals and the whole sector is going to be so, so fundamental to how we see the world in the next coming decades. Um, you know, there's this constant move to natural medicine. Uh, and I think this is, uh, and coming from a single mo drug molecule clinical trial environment, I mean, yes, I understand the full value of uh, 
you know, clinical trials, uh, the need for proprietary rights on those uh, research. But I look at also orphan drugs. I look at uh, the fact that when it comes to medicinal cannabis, it's often excluded because it's so good uh, and it helps with so many comorbidities that it just doesn't make for a good clinical subset. And I think that's really important. Look at real world data, look at real implementation, look at places like Portugal, Uruguay, look at their policies on drug policy. I mean, people are always going to move to regulate their own moods, emotions, and their health. And there's no government that's going to stop that. And I think the moment governments understand that and work with citizenry in terms of like enabling uh, their, their rights. And I mean, everyone would rather just access it safely. So why can't we just make it simple? Like get back to fundamentals. Um, find it, like you said, the wine and the powerade in the fridge. It's manageable. Yes, we can compare harms. Yes, we can debate. But I think this discussion has been really insightful and of a high level. And Serbs, I'm going to hand it back to you. If you saw, I see you've been straining there the eyes. If there's some additional questions I might have missed in the last few minutes that you want to raise, do that. And please uh, be sure to close out our event and thank everyone involved. And I just want to thank the panelists. It's been absolutely amazing. It's been such a high-level conversation. I'm really looking forward to the next discussions in this space. Uh, and to everyone else, uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar as much as I did. Excellent. Thanks so much, uh, Jeff. I think you've done an, an incredible job in moderating today's uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, I think, you know, there's just so many, you know, uh, areas that need a lot more time in terms of delving into and, and, and sort of really thrashing out. But I think this has been such a, uh, a comprehensive discussion from, you know, very uh, esteemed uh, and, and um, well-positioned players in the industry. Uh, and, uh, and, and so on that note, I think there, there are actually quite a few questions that have come in from, from across a number of platforms. Um, but I think what I will request is that um, we we will um, look to to answer these some of these offline, um, and we are actually going to uh, be posting uh, the details to our next webinar. And so I think we'll be able to sort of continue this discussion uh, next month. Uh, I think the uh, 18th of May is when we're looking to have our webinar around cultivation risk management and sort of thinking about a strategy there, which is an extremely difficult part of uh, the, the cannabis industry to get right, as Leslie has, has, has mentioned here. But um, I, I think in the interest of time, we will sort of be looking to wrap up now. Um, and so I think on, on my side, uh, just to sort of conclude and, and tie everything together, uh, thank you so much to, to the extraordinary panel, uh, the uh, attendees. There's uh, been some great sort of engagement and, and some good questions. I saw Nick Heinemann gave a really good breakdown of his view on the job creation potential. Uh, and I think uh, he touches on certain industries that a lot of people don't actually think about, for example, tourism. Um, uh, Greg um, uh, Beadle has made actually a very good point about how come locally grown cannabis is harder to get to patients than imported cannabis, which is just one of the many, uh, you know, sort of bottlenecks and challenges that need to be um, addressed and sorted out uh, with urgency within the, the local industry. Uh, and there's a whole lot uh, more in terms of questions that we won't have uh, the chance to, to get into today. But, um, you know, so what I'd just like to first, uh, what I'd like to close with is a thank you to uh, sort of our sponsors tonight, Aeroside, um, who's our platinum sport sponsors, but Schindler's, um, Separation, 7NRG, Zubalola, and of course, our US partner, Global Go. Um, and um, I'd like to just uh, end off by uh, encouraging everyone uh, to have a look at Friends of Hemp and some of the work that they're doing um, and really sort of, uh, you know, sort of engage with the organization because, um, your contribution and your support can go a long way towards um, unlocking key um, changes that can uh, that can ensure the the long term viability and scaling of this industry. Um, so on that note, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much to our panelists uh, for your time and your insights and your wisdom. Um, this has certainly been one of the most uh, rich. Uh, um, um, webinars that we've we've hosted and we very much look forward to having everyone uh, back uh, again uh, next month for uh, for the next webinar in our webinar series for 2022 thank you